get started. Um, we've got a little group in person today. Most of the folks are joining us via Zoom, so hello, virtual friends. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, this is a program put on uh, by me, obviously, the Community Outreach Archivist at the Roberts Library. My name is Danielle Absorda. Um, everyone here and on Zoom hear me okay. You're welcome to say in the chat if it's hard to hear me. I know I'm wearing a mask. Um, I had COVID last week, so I'm just being cautious. Uh, okay, cool. Um, looks like everyone can hear me. Haven't seen anything. Make sure. Okay, awesome. Great. Uh, we're doing this program in partnership with both the Dunbar Historic Neighborhood Association and uh, here, people come in. I think you should be able to, it's just like a push. Yeah, it's a little slimy thing. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing this uh, program with the Dunbar Historic Neighborhood Association and the Quapaw Quarter Association. And I'm going to give Patricia and April from those organizations a minute to talk a little bit about what those organizations are and some events they have coming up that you can take part in if you'd like. So, y'all can just come up here. If you kind of stand in this general area, the camera should find you. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Danielle, for inviting us to collaborate on this. I'm Patricia Lick, Executive Director of the Quapaw Quarter Association. We are Little Rock's historic preservation advocate, founded in 1968, and we advocate for historic resources throughout Greater Little Rock. So, um, even though folks traditionally think of the Quapaw Quarter as the North Park or uh, the first mansion areas, um, really we we fight for preservation throughout throughout Little Rock. Um, so we're really pleased to be here today and uh, and share the word on this. There are a couple of announcements I wanted to make. I asked Danielle if it was okay. We have a preservation conversation coming up on Thursday. I'm sorry. Yes, Thursday of this week. Um, it is about the Scipio Jones portrait that was recently installed at the Scipio Jones Post Office on South Main Street. The artist, Wade Hampton, is going to be coming into town and speaking on a panel with um, uh, John Gill, who has really led the fundraising and for the portrait, and also Colin Thompson Lookouts, who is their art manager, and he is going to talk about public art as well. So if you're interested in coming to that program, just RSVP at QA at Quapaw.com. And uh, it is going to be a Flanders Smith, one of the partners in this, in this endeavor this week. And I'm also sharing with all the attendees the schedule for the rest of the year for our preservation conversations. Um, we have them usually the second Thursday of each month. And most of the time at the Pay Factory, there's one coming up that's special at Flanders Smith. And then the last thing I'm going to mention is our city garden beer and ice cream social coming up on August the 28th in Current Hall. It is a fundraiser between 5 and 7 p.m. And we will have uh, locally brewed beer and locally brewed ice cream. We're partnering with uh, Stone's Throw, La Molly, and we're going to have a food truck as well. The least food truck is going to be there to sell food. Um, but you can find information at our website, quawa.com, about city garden. So, again, thank you all for coming. We love your interest in historic properties and our beer. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm Angel Hart. I am the executive director for the Dunbar Historic Neighborhood Association. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, we're right here in the Dunbar Historic Neighborhood. We're in the historic uh, Sue Cowan's Library. Uh, Sue Cowan uh, was the teacher who fought against disparities between uh, white teachers' um, pay and black uh, teachers' pay and, and actually got that pay changed. So uh, if you're a teacher or educator, we are still uh, benefiting from that today. So um, history is very important. Um, and we will learn more about that um, historical history as, as far as it relates to African-American communities. From Dan Danielle today. I want to thank uh, Cows and Danielle for giving us the opportunity to be partnering as well as uh, uh, Patricia, Patricia Blink. She's, uh, she is a definitely a trailblazer and she talks about Papa and uh, she, they actually help everybody as far as historic preservation. Uh, she has truly been a friend of the Dunbar Historic Neighborhood Association and I, I, I certainly uh, appreciate her and uh, her mentorship to me. Uh, the Neighborhood Association began back in 2018. Uh, we received our historic distinction in 2013, our historic distinction in 2013. And really, this really all ties in today, uh, what Danielle's been talking about as far as African-American historic 
homes, black homes here in our community, uh, because that is the reason why we have a historical distinction. And we're very proud of that. Cheryl Nichols was a huge part of making sure that we got that distinction. Her research um, uh, really afforded us to have that. Dunbar is actually the first black community post-slavery. The first black community post-slavery. And I am very proud to say that. For those of you who may or may not be familiar with Ninth Street, the Ninth Street corridor, the Ninth Street district, which really Little Rock's Wall Street, um, all those folks, all those entrepreneurs that are right here in the Dunbar community in these historical homes that still exist here today. And so um, again, uh, our goal, our mission as the Dunbar Historic Neighborhood Association is to preserve that cultural history um, through education, through collaborations, through our partnerships. And uh, we're very proud of that. Again, we're, we, we're, we are having our, um, uh, our eighth year community festival, September the 24th. And we are excited about that because we started the festival to let everyone know about the historical distinction that we received in 2013. We started the festival in 2014. So we are partnering this year for the community gardens. So everything will be held in the community garden and around this area. So uh, make sure you mark that on your calendar. I also wanted to tie in the preservation conversation about Scipio Apicanus Jones. Scipio Apicanus Jones lived right here in Dunbar at 1872 Cross Street. And so his significance as um, the uh, African American attorney that uh, was able, his case went off, the case that, uh, for the Elaine Massacre uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court in 1925, and he was able to exonerate 12 black men for murder, which is unheard of during that time. So to honor him, to know that he walked these grounds and the and these and this and this neighborhood makes me very proud. And um, this this conversation um, today and also on Thursday, we all need to be a part of it because if you don't know your history, or you let your history die, then you die. And so uh, again, we're um, excited for today. This is uh, a, a wonderful way of um, acknowledging uh, this community and helping. Uh, everyone know the importance of um, uh, historical homes. I won't take very much more of your time, but I will tell you just a small little story about myself. When, I, when we started the community festival back in 2014, and I was helping as a community uh, member, um, who have, I've lived in the community, have my home here, both raised my children, all three of my children went to Dunbar, my mom went to Dunbar, she's 92 years old. I had no idea about historical homes or anything like that. I mean, I knew a little bit, but not really the significance of them, right? Not only is the significance of the historical home the time frame, but also the history of the people that have lived in the home. So I think it's really exciting to find out that information, and Danielle will be talking to us about that. And the more you find out about your history, the more excited you are about yourself. So that energy has really engulfed me through the years, and I hope that energy uh, engulfs you today. So thank you again, and we appreciate everyone being here.
memory lab and personal archiving programs. Wish I could get this guy to move. There we go. Sorry about that. Hybrid programming is very new to me, so <laughs> figuring it all out. Um, so our memory lab is a uh, DIY digitization station. So you can bring in your family records, your photographs, um, and audiovisual materials, and you can digitize those in our in our do-it-yourself lab after a short little instructional session. Um, and that's open uh, Tuesday through Friday, 10.15 to 4.30 p.m. And it's by appointment only, but those appointments are super easy to make at robertslibrary.org, or you're welcome to uh, call the branch and we'll get you connected to someone to get you an appointment made. Um, we also have uh, kits in every library branch to record oral histories. If you've got members of the community or family members that you wanna capture the stories of, um, you're welcome to check out those recorders and record those interviews. There's no requirement to donate that interview to the library or anything like that. This is just something we wanted to do for the community to provide an opportunity to um, engage those community members and capture those stories before it's too late. So we have that. And then we also offer personal archiving classes once a month, and those are via Zoom. And you can basically ask any questions you have about preserving your family records, and there will be kind of a a short program about the ways to house that stuff long term, the best ways to organize it, and what you can do with things that you're concerned of, about the degradation of. Um, so we offer uh, all that programming, and if you've got any questions about that, you're welcome to reach out to myself or um, someone else at the Roberts Library, and you're always welcome to call the branch and we can get you connected to the right person. Um, and then the last thing is uh, we've got our annual genealogy workshop coming up and that will be on October 1st from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. We're doing that in a hybrid format as well. I think that uh, the person running it, Heather Spendon, has got the case worked out a little better than me. Um, and that will be at the Ron Robinson Theater and then also via Zoom. Um, we are asking everyone to register through Zoom though in case we do need to move fully virtual. We're just keeping an eye on the release now for this one. So, um, you're welcome to register for that through robertslibrary.org. We've also got a Facebook event if that's how you get connected with us. So now I'm going to actually jump into the program. Thanks for all that housekeeping stuff. Um, if you're with me in person today and you didn't get the handouts, I'll be kind of going through those as we go through the demonstration today. So those three are at the front. Did anybody miss those? Cool. Um, if you're joining virtually, I think um, our Zoom master Heather is going to share out a link to those. Um, there will be three things, a little guide that just kind of helps you capture some important information that you'll need for the database that we're using. Um, it gives you sort of a checklist of the, of the major resources we're going to look through today, and then it gives you a place to write some notes. Um, and I just kind of made that to give you kind of a, a guided way to walk through it the first time you do it. Um, and also, I've got an ownership tracking form, and basically that just gives you a place to put the year you're capturing, who lived in the house, and any notes you have about like maybe what that person did for a living, who their spouse was. You'll find that um, historical records are pretty nosy and you can find out a lot about a person. So uh, we want you to have a good place to capture all that um, in an organized way. And obviously, if these don't work for you, don't use them. You know, like this is this is all about uh, providing you resources and, and you taking it and, and, and going forward. So um, before I jump into doing the research, I did want to give some background on um, historically African American communities in Central Arkansas. Um, as you learn about the history of your own property, it's important to contextualize that with the ministry of the community that you live. Angel shared a lot about Dunbar. Um, I've got a long spiel here that I might cut a little short because she she kind of covered it for me. Um, but you'll you'll see that like that history of that community is going to inform a lot about the house itself. Um, so understanding those communities, the periods of development, the major architectural styles in the area will just sort of help you understand how your house fits into that further story. Um, and I don't pretend to be an expert on the subject. I know that a lot of you live in these communities. And if you've got you've got things that you wish I shared, then please interrupt me and tell me because I'm always wanting to learn as well. So um, and then after that, I'll jump into a specific property as a case study and we'll just kind of go step by step on how to do the research. So uh, get comfy, there are snacks. We're free to get up as I'm talking and get snacks and coffee. Um, and I want this to be pretty informal. So I am kind of standing up here and talking at you for a long time too. And I know that can be kind of great. So um, I did, uh, before I get started on the history of Dunbar, I wanted to thank Rhonda Stewart, our genealogy and local history specialist. She helped me a lot with uh, 
learning about these communities and knowing where to look for resources. Um, if you don't know Rhonda or haven't been to our Finding Family Facts monthly genealogy uh, program, she's fantastic. Her brain is out of, like irreplaceable. She she's amazing. So um, otherwise, a lot of the information comes from the National Register of Historic Places, the Encyclopedia of Arkansas History and Culture and UA Little Rock's Center for Arkansas History and Culture's Mapping Renewal Project. Um, so just to start with Dunbar, I just want to give a sense of the geographic boundaries. Um, it's bounded to the north by West 9th Street, on the east by State Street, three blocks west of Broadway, and on the south by Roosevelt Road, which was formerly 25th Street, if you're looking at historical records. And on the west by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, formerly High Street, and it comprises the southwestern section of the original city of Little Rock. Um, as Angel mentioned, uh, development in the area was driven by Little Rock's early African American community. Structures in the area date back to the 1890s and it's commonly associated with the first free African American slums in the city. The Dunbar neighborhood is also closely related to the development of West Ninth. The community members of prominent central to its development and success include Johnny Bush, Scipio Africanus Jones, and Florence Price, among many, many others, but I could be here all day listening for the people from this community. Um, and obviously, we're in the Williams Ranch Library, which is located right next door to uh, the historic Dunbar Middle School. Homes in the area at present represent some of the most affluent examples of homes built by African American residents in the city. This wasn't always the case, though. Prior to urban renewal programs in the mid century, shotgun houses were the single most prominent housing style in this community. And as a result, in 1952, a 40-acre area around Dunbar, Dunbar was designated a slum clearance project, and much of the area was unfortunately destroyed. Similarly, in 1955, the area around the Lander Smith College became Little Rock's first urban renewal project. Authorized under provisions of the Housing Act of 1954, about 10 acres were cleared. This widespread demolition thoroughly changed the character of the community. Only about a dozen shotgun houses still stand today, and despite the age and history of the area, forgot to go to this <laughs> um, And despite the age and history of the area, several blocks contain more buildings constructed during or after the 1950s than before. As you'll see today, the remaining historic homes were built by some of the most prominent members of the late 19th and early 20th century African American community in Little Rock. Because of this significance and the proximity to many historically African American educational institutions. The community received a district designation by the National Register in 2013. This has led to a great effort to rehabilitate the historic properties in the district and a continued effort to promote the history of the community. And it led to the creation of the Arts and Center Association. Um, next, I wanted to talk about West 9th Street. I think that's probably the community that people in Little Rock are most familiar with. Um, it emerged as a predominantly African American neighborhood during the Civil War. In 1863, the Federal Army, which occupied Little Rock, began constructing log cabins in the area for freed slaves. After the war, many stayed and settled there. By 1870, what was originally known as Little Rock's West Cape Street was renamed West Ninth Street. More African Americans settled west of Mount Holly Cemetery between 9th and 12th. And as the population grew, a five block section along West Ninth Street between Broadway and Chester became the central black business district. Um, through the 18th and ninth, sorry, late 19th and early 20th centuries, African Americans created fraternal organizations, one of the most prominent of which was based on 9th Street. The Mosaic Templars in America was established in 1882 by Chester Keats and John Edward Bush, two former slaves who later became employees of the U.S. Postal Service's Railway Mail Service. Bush also served as principal of Capitol Hill School, Little Rock's first public school for African Americans. Mosaic offered life and burial insurance policies. By 1883, the MTA had received its official state charter. Sorry. <laughs> um, and in 1913, the MTA built its headquarters on the, the corner of 9th and Broadway, and this became a center for business and entertainment on West 9th Street. As you probably know, the Mosaic Sports Cultural Center is located on that site now in a reproduction of the original building. Um, another prominent building um, is Torian Temple, which opened in 1918 at 800 West 9th Street at the opposite end of what became known as the line from the Mosaic Templars building. Black business owners occupied five blocks between West Broadway and Chester Streets in downtown, with a laundromat, restaurants, stenographer, notary public offices, retail shops, and more. The 1920s was known as the golden era for the area's black community. West 9th Street continued to grow throughout this time, but the Great Depression devastated many businesses. 
services and led to um, the closing of the Rodeo Awards. Between 1930 and 35, 11% of West 9th Street businesses closed. The Templars themselves declared bankruptcy soon after the crash. During the 1930s, social clubs began moving to Orient Temple's spacious third floor for dancing and club meetings, creating Dreamland Ballroom. Um, it hosted many high class acts like Dizzy Gillespie, Matt King Cole, Duke Ellington, E.B. King, and many more. And by the 1940s, Philander Smith College and Upper High School also used the Dreamland Ballroom for social functions. Um, as a result of urban renewal projects, though, uh, West Ninth eventually saw a, a decline and um, and was eventually uh, blighted by these programs. Uh, sorry, lost my lost my points. Uh, e. Finley Vincent, former director of the Housing Authority and its slum clearance projects, and various agencies systematically work to continue segregation um, by, by destroying these areas. For those who refused to sell as part of this program, the uh, Housing Authority evicted those residents and business owners from downtown, after which West 9th Street's business had rapidly declined by most closing by the mid-1960s. And the destruction of I-630 eventually ended West 9th Street. Also affecting businesses and homes in the area uh, was this construction. The only surviving structure from the heyday of the neighborhood is the Orient Mall, which was listed on the National Register in 1982. In 1991, Arkansas Flag and Banner purchased the building, and business owner Terry McCoy began working to renovate the Orient Ballroom. I did want to mention here that we have a project through the Butler Center called Lost West 9th Street that has a lot of photographs that were actually taken by the Pop Mall Quarter Association prior to. Uh, the construction of I-630 that document a lot of the buildings in Los, um, including, this is a photograph of some shotgun houses in, on West Night. I'm going to move on to Central High. I'm going to take a drink of water, though. <laughs> Talk it a lot. The Central High is not a historically African-American community. For most of the last hundred years, it has been a mixed-race community. And since the late 20th century, it has been predominantly African American. The area has been defied by a momentous historical event that occurred 80 years after the property was initially plotted for development. In fact, 86% of the structures were already built 10 years before the crisis of Cathedral High. The notoriety that this district gains from its association with such a nationally significant event does not diminish its development representative growth in the first half of the century as a middle working class neighborhood of mixed use and interracial composition. The architecture of the neighborhood is overwhelmingly colonial revival and craftsman in style, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, moreover, the variation in building scale and decorative detailing seen through the district expresses the demographic and socioeconomic variety of its residents. The original historic district is founded by Martin Luther King Drive, so basically the bar runs into Central High. Um, and it's founded by Bayer on the west, West Pell Street to the north, and Roosevelt to the south. And it was added to the register in 1996. Um, in 2012, the boundaries of the district were expanded to include West 17th Street, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Wright Avenue, South Summit, and South Battery. Basically, what that did is there used to be a gap between the Dunbar and Stork Neighborhood Associate, or Dunbar and Stork Neighborhood and Central High Stork Neighborhood, and that sort of closed the gap to make sure that all of those areas were represented. Um, for their, their historical relevance. Um, the next community I'm going to talk about is Granite Mountain that has sort of a complicated history and relationship with the Black community. Um, I wanted to thank Acadia Rower specifically for her research on Granite Mountain prior to her going out there to view photographs and some buildings before they were destroyed and trying to uh, document the history of that community. Um, there really wasn't much out there, so it's great that she did that. Um, the, the area known as Granite Mountain near Fish Creek was cleared of 165 homes and other structures in the early 1950s to make way for thousands of new residents virtually overnight. Booker Homes, a 400 unit public housing complex at the new Granite Heights subdivision, were meant to house African American residents displayed by some American projects. City leaders had first shown interest in the area decades before when the land was needed to house people who made homeless during the Great Depression. 
The city purchased a large tract of land in 1934 that became the center of a push by African American community leaders for a public park. At the time, there were six public parks in Little Rock for white residents, while African American residents were forced to rely on generous private landowners for outdoor recreation. Finally, in 1949, the growing African American political force pressured the city to hold an election for a bond issue to fully fund what became Yellow Park. When the bond issue was surprisingly approved and the park was finally built out, other massive changes in Grand and Mountain in the city were underway. City leaders used the funds as leverage to secure millions of dollars in federal funding for their slum clearance and urban renewal. There was a pool that opened at Gillen Park just one year before residents began moving in at Booker Homes. But as is with most amenities in the far eastern corner, city officials allocated too few resources for its upkeep. The most immediately tragic result was the drowning of a 12 year old boy in 1954. Understaffed, under equipped, and far away from emergency services, Gillen Park um, became what was cited as a death trap by LC and Daisy Bates in uh, Free Press. I mean, sorry, in the state press. And they said at the incident, the whole affair was a study in second class citizenship. Booker Homes, too, became a hazardous uh, situation due to limited, limited resources and neglect. In 1988, an article in the New York Times reported on the Hope 6 program. Um, on a scale not seen in decades, the federal government is helping cities clear slums again. But this time, the slums it helped, these are the slums it helped create. Public housing projects crippled by a flawed policy and mismanagement, overwhelmed by poverty. Little Rock housing officials began to apply for these funds in 1996 and were awarded over $1.5 million in 2000 to demolish Booker Homes. Most Grand and Mountain residents were displaced during this round of housing demolition, and they were likely given vouchers to find housing in the private sector. Book 6 led to a shortage of affordable and accessible low income housing that Little Rock and other cities are still facing today. The area is operated now by Audubon, Arkansas, and most of its historical structures have been demolished and have been rebuilt in. But Audubon, Arkansas is trying to work to preserve the, the history of that community. Um, Thank you for bearing with me. I know this is a lot of a lot of stuff. I just wanted to make sure and cover a lot of these communities that don't get talked about very much. Um, next, I want to talk about the Panky community um, that was founded by Josephine Panky and her husband Samuel. They purchased 80 acres of land outside of the rock. It would grow into a black community rich in culture and heritage. Some of the early families to the area included the Mosses, Gregory's, Johnsons, and Bledsoe's that owned businesses in the area. The area's first church opened in 1911. Um, when the when the Pinky Chapel African American African Methodist Episcopal Church opened. After the lynching of John Carter in 1927, the growth of Pinky was fast tracked. Josephine and her husband didn't live in the area until after Carter's murder, a time when several black families began to look for other places to live to escape the racial tension inside the city. The Pinky community became a, a haven. Josephine sold lots upon lots of land to several families, some for as little as $10 or $15. Sometimes those were even accepted as payment. The home eventually, became, the community eventually became home to about 400 residents. Three more churches were added between 1929 and 1947. There was, um, that brought about the need for a school. There was a one room building that held grades one through eight. And in the 1940s, um, some concept huts were taken from Camp Robinson and used for additional classrooms for upper grades. Uh, there was an elementary school established in the 50s, and it was at, at its height home to more than 200 African American students that attended the school through 1965. It was also home to a thriving business community that included some uh, community stalwarts as Bob's Cafe, a pool, bar, pool, pool hall, Lily Snack Bar, White Eagle Cafe, an outdoor movie theater, a grocery store, and a gas station. Unfortunately, none of those businesses survive today. Through the years, the community dwindled, and the city of Little Rock annexed it in 1975. It has shrunk in size as the capital city sprawled into the westward. Uh, when the community was established, Pinky named some of the streets Crockett, Dunbar, Wrightsell, Langston, Gibbs, Ives, Washington, and Connor were prominent members of the African American. However, several of these streets have been renamed when the community was annexed by the city. Connor and Washington streets were renamed Josephine Street and Pinky Avenue, respectively. A few dozen African American families remain today. However, a positive note for life of the community and its continued um, importance was the opening of the Josephine Pinky Center on November 15, 2016, that serves as a, a community um, 
and then I want to talk about East End and South End. Um, East End is the community east of Bond Street, and it goes to the airport, and then it's north of 15th Street to the river. Um, there are some well-known people from the area, such as Sydney Moncrief and Bobby Portis. The residential development in that area of the city was slightly stunted after its initial growth. Um, and then it got split into East End and West End um, because of the streetcar kind of running up the middle of it. Much of this growth can be um, attributed to the creation of the streetcar, the organizers of which own a large amount of land west of the city. Consequently, streetcar tracks hardly touch the eastern edges. This area is part of a larger area known as Hanger Hill, and as a result of gentrification of the lake area has been um, the East Village now. So if you're familiar with, with the development in that direction. It's important to note that the development of I-630 drastically changed this area, as it is now divided by both Interstate 30 and 630 from the rest of the world. South End is defined as the area between I-30 and the Barton Coliseum, Roosevelt Road, to, and, and Roosevelt Road to 33rd Street. Early city directories show it as a purely mixed race community until World War II, and it was then predominantly black until recent additions of Hispanic and white residents. St. Mark Baptist Church, one of the largest churches in the city, began in this area, and many historical figures lived in the area, including Daisy and also Bates, Ozell Sutton, Marion Taylor, who was the first black Arkansas State Trooper, Mary Higgins, the Pulaski County Sheriff, Sidney Moncrief in his high school years, NFL coach George Stewart, Sunset Park Tiger football program, and uh, Earl Quigley, the person who Central Stadium is named for. And they all lived in the area prior to 1950, and that all came out of August of this time. Joe's Mini Mart, which is in the area, is believed to be the first 24 hour convenience store in Little Rock. It opened in the early 1970s. And Lassus Inn, known for their catfish for more than 50 years, is in the area, and the original Sim Barbecue started. Thrasher's Boys and Girls Club is in the area, and Sanford Tollett, long-term director of the Joseph Fiber Qantas Campus Ferndale grew up in the area. Um, and now I'm going to kind of move out of the Little Rock proper in the county and talk about some of the, the smaller um, historically black communities in the county. Um, the first one is Wrightsville, which has kind of, kind of a complicated history as um, both being predominantly black and a center of racial, racial violence in the state. Um, it's located on Highway 365 in southeastern Pulaski County, and it existed as an unincorporated settlement for more than a century before it was incorporated late in the 20th century. Although some plantations have been established to the north and west of the site, the actual location of Wrightsville remained unclaimed until construction of Little Rock, the Little Rock, Mississippi, and Texas Railroads in the 1870s. Although the community remained to, chose to remain unincorporated, it grew pretty steadily. And by 1927, um, the, the American Red Cross noted there were 880 refugees from the 1927 flood in the Wrightsville area. The state of Arkansas established a juvenile correction facility in Wrightsville in 1931, and the facility was dedicated to housing and instruction of young African Americans. The main building of the facility was built by the WPA, and it held up to 69 young men between the ages of 14 and 17, all who had been convicted um, with minor infractions, and there was a well-known fire there on March 5, 1959, that claimed the lives of 21 residents of the facility, who were unfortunately trapped behind locked doors when the fire began. Others escaped from an employee broken glass in one of the locked doors. After that, a, a new adult state correctional facility opened in 1921. I mean, sorry, 1981. <laughs> the Wright School unit has capacity for 800 um, incarcerated. It housed a boot camp until the program was moved to the Tucker unit in 2010. And uh, Wrightsville incorporated the town in 1973 and then reincorporated as a second class city in 1982 so that city services could be provided to the residents. Wrightsville is home to Future Builders, a nonprofit community organization that seeks to train residents to become self sufficient through education, training, and mobilization of resources. And the city also has two churches, a Baptist church and a Christian Methodist Church. There's just two more, Sweet Elm and Woodson. Sweet Elm is a small rural community um, that is a majority black in Pulaski County. Of more than two dozen communities in Arkansas, Lake Sweet Elm to have obtained a post office. 
This is the only community to have maintained its own parking. Its Hanger Cotton Gin is Arkansas's oldest cotton gin on the National Register of Historic Places. And Sweet Home had the state's only Florida Sprint gin home for black and white mothers that began supporting, um, that was begun by supporters of the white home in Little Rock from 1950 to the early 1960s. Sweet Home has been home to many notable people. Uh, Scipio Africanus Jones briefly taught school there. Ryder Henry Davis was born there. Sarah Elizabeth Chaplin Herman. Arkansas's only Red Cross volunteer nurse in the Spanish American War was born near Sweet Home. Calvin Coleman Bliss, Arkansas's first lieutenant governor, retired there. And Carla Coleman, chair of the Black History Commission of Arkansas, grew up near her grandparents in a tin shirt. When the Union Army freed Little Rock slaves in 1863, Little Rock's Black Wesley Chapel transferred from the Methodist Episcopal Church in the S to the Methodist Episcopal Church, the ME Church. And the congregation had several local and they built a church using some of the lumber from a cypress tree cut down to clear the land. Its, the, its first pastor was Ezra Roberts, and a large stone church replaced it in 1906, and then a smaller one in 1952. And uh, at first, this church served all of Sweet Home. Uh, oops, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, the built in 1888. Allen Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church began on Highway 365 to the north and then Greater Zion Hill Baptist Church over to the south. For most of its history, Sweet Home consisted mostly of family farms such as those of the Cunninghams, Hangers, or Ratcliffe's. A community leader, the Elder Cunningham, became a justice of the peace, had a police force, and home court in his house. German immigrants settled in the area to the south in the late 1800s. Many African Americans migrated away during the early 20th century, but this did not close the Black ME and AME churches in Sweet Home. The Great Depression forced some to return to the land to make a living, but unfortunately, bauxite strip mining from the 1940s to the 60s ravaged much of the land and left, left large amounts of dirt and rainwater filled blue holes in the area. In 1963, the Pulaski County School Board phased out Sweet Home's 80 year old wooden frame elementary school. The Sweet Home Economic Opportunity Center leased the building as a neighborhood study center until the school board decided to sell the building in 1968. The Sweet Home Community Workers Association bought it for a community center, paying off the note uh, with local fundraising. The center would open 11 hours a day and help provide access for preschool children, tutoring for school children, recreational equipment, and hot lunches to the elderly while the U.S. Department of Agriculture gave hot meals to children and recreational activities. The weekly Bible class met in the center health fund that as well. Since 2000, Sweet Home's population has declined, and its 2010 census designated uh, place population was 849, and the community has been busy since that review. Um, the last community I want to talk about is Woodson. Uh, local lore states that Woodson is named for Ed Wood Sr., who is said to have come from Alabama around 18. The same work credits him with helping to fund the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge, which dates prior to his arrival in Arkansas, and that is likely not true. Um, what is described as the first African American plantation owner in Arkansas, which is also unsubstantiated. Um, <laughs> other explanations for the naming of the town are, are not available, so most locals go with those. <laughs> Meanwhile, the railroad went through several changes of ownership, becoming St. Louis and Iron Mountain Railroad, the Missouri Pacific Railroad, and eventually. The Union Pacific Railroad and, and ran through uh, Woodson during the period. In 1915, the area of Woodson and Hensley was returned to Pulaski County. A highway running parallel to the railroad was built between Little Rock and Pine Bluff, with Pulaski County and Jefferson County funding the project. Some county was unable to contribute money to the project, so the land was reclaimed by Pulaski County to avoid having to reroute the railroad further to the east, which explains why Woodson was incorporated in Pulaski County rather than. Um, by 1962, principal landmarks included the Woodson Baptist Church and Woodson Elementary School, which was um, a, a black elementary school. In May of that year, the church and school petitioned the county government to close the westernmost block of Woodson's four blocks along the main street. The church wanted to build a new sanctuary on the former street, and the school favored closing of the street to increase safety. During research leading to the second hearing, records were found verifying the incorporated status of the town. Although state law permitted the county judge to dissolve the challenge charter because it didn't have any elections for more than five years. After further hearings were completed, the street remained closed 
and the incorporation of what some of the incident community was involved. The school was closed as three small schools for African Americans were consolidated into a new school in Wrightsville. And this is a photograph from Wrightsville Pacific High School after the consolidation. Um, we actually have a lot of Wright School yearbooks in our collection that we've recently digitized. Um, they're pretty interesting. Uh, it documents what you know most people don't think of as an enclosed black community having a very rich and expansive uh, black community. Um, and at the time, the community included eight churches and one store that had recently, and they recently built a new post office in the plaza. It also had paved its streets and built a line providing natural bathroom homes. The population in the early 21st century was about 450 and was uh, mostly African American. And that's everything I have on the Thanks for bearing with me. That was kind of a long one, huh? <laughs> um, so now I'm going to dive into actually doing the property research. I just wanted to give you some context. Um, we're going to be talking about a property today that's located in Dunbar, um, but that doesn't mean that the, that houses outside of that community and then lesser known communities matter any less. I just wanted to do a Dunbar house since we're in Dunbar today. So um, just some general overview of the resources we have available. Sorry, I have a hair that is like under my mask and dropping me insane. Um, Genealogy resources that are available include city directories, which I also like to call the nosy phone book. Basically, um, it's it, it has both uh, address listings, so you can go street by street and look at who owned the homes or lived in the homes, or you can go by the name of the person and it'll give you more information, like what they did for a living, who they were married to, um, more information than you would probably want out there in the world now. Um, we still publish city directories, but we no longer have uh, information about who people are married to or living for a living. They mostly just have the uh, property owner information. Um, and then census records, which were captured every 10 years, um, we have those through Ancestry. And the 1950 census was just released also. So they do it um, 70 years after publication of people's personal information. Um, and the unfortunate thing though about the 50 census is it's not indexed very well yet. So there's an interface where you can search it, um, but the results are pretty hit and miss at the moment until it's indexed a little better. But people are working all the time to, to get it indexed. And then some architectural history resources um, include fire insurance maps. Uh, these were maps put out by uh, the Sanborn company. They would come and survey properties and the maps include um, a footprint of the home, the structural material of the home and uh, where it sits on its lot and what the address is. And that can be really helpful, especially um, if you've had an address change over time, um, or it becomes very obvious if a different house was on the site before the house that you are looking at, because you can tell by the footprint typically if it's the same or not. Um, and if you can't tell by the footprint, you can um, tell what the construction material is. So if it went from a wood frame house to a brick house, you can tell that from the Sanborn maps. Um, and also uh, the QQA records at the Roberts Library, uh, the Pop-Up Order Association generously donated all of their records to us. And they have research on a lot of individual homes in the community and what we call the address file series. And I'll show you what it looks like to do that as we go through the case study. Um, and those are great because people have kind of already done some of the work for you in a lot of cases. They also surveyed a lot of neighborhoods um, in the 60s and 70s and so there's photographs of a lot of houses um, and then surveyed ones. And actually Patricia brought both some in print city directories. So these are available in Ancestry um, up to around 1950, but they're available in print at both the Roberts Library and the Pop Up Order Association. Um, I think the QQA method is the seven. We actually, um, the city of Little Rock cleared out the, everything in their office until about maybe five years back. So we have to go ahead up until like the 2000s. Oh, no. Well, and it's kind of interesting. And Danielle was saying, this gives a little information about where you worked and if you were married to or not or what have you, and also ownership sometimes. And, but then more recent ones, because I actually just researched my property for a program we had a couple weeks ago. We had a little estimate on the value of your house. So it's kind of funny oh. to me 
is my personal opinion. Yeah, no, I'm going to walk you through Ancestry. It is definitely easier to look through the books because, like, you'll, I'm going to walk over the camera so the folks at home can see it. But in the book, you'll see how Ancestry is kind of like the Typically, it's either the front or the back, and they were never consistent. That's why would they be? That'd be too easy. Um, but you'll have a name first section, and then in the opposite side of the book, you'll have address listings first. And um, often, whenever you're doing the research, I will go through. Um, you'll you'll find the address, and you'll find the person's name, and then you'll want to go look at the person's name to see maybe who they were married to or uh, what they do for a living. And a lot of times it will also mention, um, like, if they own the business where that business is located, and that can be, you know, just helpful to build more context about the ownership history of your home. So I'm going to make it personal. Yeah. So this is 1940, and that's the year that my mother was born. And so I'm looking at my grandparents. So this is Mary Ellen Shelton. So Shelton, a lot of Shelton's around. <laughs> Otis E., my grandfather, Mary E., Mary Ellen, and he was a stock clerk, stock clerk. And at that time, they were living on West 13th Street. Um, but it's quite interesting to connect to the family. And so my grandparents are gone. But we've made some awesome discoveries by using these. And so every now and then, when I'm working with somebody on something, I'll flip through and try to figure out where my grandparents were living at that time, if, you know, they're in that book. So um, so it is it is that connection. So those are posts by you? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, not every year. Uh, I would say there are some years that are combined, there are some years that are missing, um, but it gives you it's a pretty good, pretty good survey. I think we have it from like 1872 until almost just maybe five years ago. So it is, it is a great business. So I'm going to put it out there in the library as well. Yes. Um, and then they're, they're on Ancestry, um, both for personal subscription and come into a library branch, uh, you can use Ancestry Library in any library branch. So if you're a Williams patron, you're welcome to come here and use the computers. Also, if you're on your own computer using the Wi-Fi in the building, you can also access Ancestry. Um, it's just AncestryLibrary.com instead of Ancestry.com. Um, that will redirect you to the correct uh, Ancestry. And if all of this information is overwhelming, I think it will become a little clearer as I actually go through the case study and you see me kind of utilizing these tools. Um, but I wanted to show you what the surveys looks like. So basically, uh, folks would go around, they take a photograph of the house, and then they would just kind of write some information. Um, if they could find out an approximate construction date, who owned the home at the time, um, that sort of information. And then they document the architectural style, and then um, what kind of siding and windows and all that stuff. Um, so they're they're pretty helpful. Um, I will say that for unfortunately for a lot of um, the historically black areas of town, there are not surveyed ones. Um, those areas were not surveyed. Uh, the focus was on the governor's mansion sort of district. Um, there there is a later survey in Central High. Um, but what other surveys are there? Well, I would say too. Um, this was done. And we were just chatting about this. Some of this was done as a result of the worry about the 630. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. And so that's really when we got some of our earliest historic districts established. Um, but there are there is good information through the state. And um, Danielle includes them as a resource yes. ACC. They are constantly updating these neighborhoods that have been house by house surveyed. This for us is an excellent resource because buildings have changed over time. So we know basically these were done in 19. We know in 1977, the snapshot in time is how these areas looked. So, yeah. um, and it was the same situation. The Garth Park was threatened because of Earth Ritual too, though. It was an area that had gone down, downhill, and the worry was that it was going to get Earth Ritual. So, same, same thing. It was a kind of a crisis. Get it recorded, get attention in the area. But that's why we have more documentation because that's certainly going to keep the bay focused. Yeah, originally it was that area north of Arthur and Arsenal. Um, yeah, and so there's surveys with both the Papa Porter Association and the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, which is our state historic preservation office. Every state has one of those. The National Register created those offices. Um, and uh, later in the slides, I have contact information for the, press, the uh, survey historian there. His name's Travis Rodderman. And they keep files on, I mean, they may not have files on every individual house, but they've surveyed a lot of property. 
space. So I always recommend people reaching out and seeing if they've got anything on their house uh, because they may. So it's always good to good to find. And then there's also just a variety of books at the Public Water Association that we don't have at Roberts that are focused on architectural history. So if you're just trying to get a better understanding of uh, the architectural style of your home and that sort of thing, uh, Public Water Association is going to be the people for that. I'm Morty. I can help you find out who lived there, when it was built, how to look at a newspaper, how to look at a census. Um, they're going to be the resource for like, this is the architectural style this is very built. And um, you know, they've got a lot in their brains about like even specific architects that may have worked on homes that I just can Sometimes you look at the house and you're like, oh yes, it's a Charles Thompson. I'm like, obviously it's a Charles Thompson. <laughs> I have no idea. So um, you know we're always learning too, trust me. Yeah, you're yeah. always learning. So that's an excellent question. Yeah. So yeah. is there a resource that shows the architect the Not necessarily, no. Um Sometimes you can hunt down drawings um, if they're cataloged. Um, I always recommend people just do searches in the uh, Arkansas State Archives, the Butler Center's catalog, which I'll, I'm going to share a link to, um, and uh, other you know repositories, libraries, um, and the Old State House Museum has drawings too. So they have the Charles Thompson. Yeah, they have the Charles Thompson drawings. It is very challenging in many cases, unless it was a very well-known architect. Mm -hmm.
if it wasn't captured in whatever aggregate is used for that other data portal, if you're searching by specific information about the property, it will pull up uh, deed transfers and stuff that you may have missed for periods of time that you don't know the ownership history. Um, so we're just gonna jump right in now into our house. Um, so our case study is 1872 Cross Street, which is located in the Dunbar neighborhood historic district. I was trying to keep it kind of a secret whose house this was because I feel like you don't know whose house it is when you start this picture. Uh, but Angel kind of gave it away in her, her intro. Um, this was Sabio Jones' house. Um, and we decided to do his house for this program because uh, his birthday was last Wednesday, yes? This past, this past Wednesday, yes. Um, and also, the house is going to be rehabilitated. There's a process going on now. Um, for that, and then also there's the program coming up and the painting, and so we just wanted to kind of tie that all together and, and use this house as our research topic. Um, so this photograph was taken in 2019 before rehabilitation efforts began. Um, it was listed on um, the uh, Preserve Arkansas's Most Endangered Sites in 2019, and that's where this uh, photo came from. Um, so. We're just going to get started. So the first step to this research is don't recreate the wheel. Look for research that already exists before you start at the very beginning. So the first thing I'd recommend is asking the Plum Quarter Association or the Historic Preservation Program if they have a survey for your property. And I've got the contact information for a survey historian at the Historic Preservation Program named Travis Raderman. Um, you can email him and he can check and see in the files if they've got anything. I'm getting right from the TV archive. Um, and, uh, and then the next thing I'd recommend doing is looking at the AR County data profile. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into that. So this is what the web page looks like whenever you get to ARCountyData.com. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select a county. So we're in Pulaski County. We're going to search real estate records. And we're going to start with the address. So we know this is 1872 and it's South Cross Street. So that's all the information I'm going to put in and I'm going to hit search. So we get one parcel. So this is just the listing results. So we're going to click that and open it. So this tells you it's currently owned by the Dunbar slash Horseman Archives and Building Project. Um, and uh, if you'll notice on your worksheet, um, I've asked you to note a few things, and these are just helpful for, especially if we use that other portal. Um, so first you're going to write down your address, obviously, and then from this form, you can capture a couple of other things. Um, the section township and range can be really helpful, as well as the lot and block number. So this is the section township and range and lot and block. Um, you can also note the subdivision, but you don't necessarily need it. Um, and these can be helpful for locating it on um, on that other portal that we're going to pop into, just to see if there's any additional records to look at. Um, especially for a uh, property where the address may have changed over time, because we used 1872 to find this. If this was not always 1872 Cross, or the street name changed, or something like that, Knowing that legal description of the property can be very helpful. Um, so I'd recommend noting that. And then the next thing I would recommend doing is going to this report and clicking parcel detail, and it will generate a PDF for you. And there's a couple of additional pieces of information on here that are good to know. Um, so We're going to go, we're going to scroll through this report real quick. So this basically just tells you who bought and sold the property since it looks like 1987. Um, and this looks like kind of a case of just passing between a bunch of different family members before it finally ended up uh, being sold uh, in, in the late 2010s. Uh, and that tells you a couple of other things. The construction type is masonry. It's a one plus story because it has the second little story here. And then this is the primary footprint. Can everybody here see that okay or am I in front of it? Okay. Uh, and then some other things to 
know that there is a concrete driveway, a frame outbuilding, a metal outbuilding um, additional to the property. Um, and then it will often give you, if you scroll past the image, if you go, it'll often give you an estimated year built. This is not correct probably, but it gives you an idea of a place to start. So if there's, if you get past that survey and there was no information on the property, you have no idea when it was built, you gotta start somewhere, right? You can't just like open a sitting directory and hope for the best. Um, so this tells us that we probably could start looking around 1930. Um, and that can be really helpful because then you aren't just basing it off of, you know, well, I know a lot of stuff in Nutbar was built in the 1910s, because if this house was built in 1930, that's 20 years of research you're probably doing before you even find the house. So I recommend starting five years before the date that's in the survey and seeing if you can find the property. Um, and then you'll just kind of do a thing of like, look a year after, look a year before, look a year after, look a year before, back and forward until you, you find what is probably the construction date. Um, so we're going to start our research with 1930, probably. So the next thing we want to do is see if, go back to my presentation, see if there's an existing register nomination. So whenever you go to, you can even Google National Register of Historic Places Arkansas, and it will probably take you to this web page. Uh, but you can go to ArkansasHeritage.com and search National Register and it will take you to this portal. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, you can look for a property. So we're looking for 1872 Cross. And you should be able to just type in the address um, and that should get you somewhere. So um, conveniently, the Scipio A. Jones house has an individual listing. So um, we're in we're in much better shape than most people typically are whenever they go to do this research. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and look at the PDF. I do want to note that this, this property was put on the register in 1999 and the standards for what was required in the 80s and 90s to get a house on the register is much different than what is required today. These nominations are much, much shorter than what, what you'll see in like a more modern 2010, 2020s nomination. Um, and this one's actually pretty lengthy for the 90s, honestly, and that's because it was written by Cheryl Nichols. So, um, so you'll see here that uh, it starts off by telling you a historic name. So the historic name of a home is typically the earliest and longest resident. So you might have a situation where somebody is clearly the first resident of a property after it was built, but they left for two years and the next person lived there for 35 years. So we're probably not, not going to name it after a person who lived there for two years. We're probably going to name it after a person who lived there for 35 years, because that's kind of the, more relative to the period of significance for the home. Um, and in some cases, you'll name it after maybe two families or something like that. It just sort of depends on what the history tells you about the home and what you end up finding out about the people who lived there. Um, so in this case, the home is named for Sophia Jones. Um, it says the address, it says where it's located. It says it has uh, one contributing building. Um, and as you scroll through, you'll get to its function. So it was historically a domestic house. It was in 1999 also a domestic house. Um, it's considered a craftsman bungalow. And then it will tell you things about uh, what it's built from. So this is a brick house with both brick and stucco walls. Um, it has a stucco gable and it has a stone and granite, stone and granite perch columns. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm not gonna like read through this entire thing, but I do want to note um, a few things about it. So basically um, this house was put on the register for its association with Sidney Jones. So this entire nomination is basically about him and less about the house. So it doesn't really even discuss ownership history following Scipio with the exception of saying it was passed to someone in the family at the end of the nomination. Um, and if you're really trying to get a full picture of the history of your home, um, for whatever reason, it's good to know more than that Scipio Jones lived there. Though that is very important and interesting and relevant, right? Um, it also says 
that the house was built in 1928, not 1930. Um, so we'll want to find out when they got that information, right? So we're going to note that 1928 or 1930, we're not sure, um, as a place to start. Um, and that's kind of everything I'm going to mention from that. Does anyone have any questions about accessing these registry nominations? Okay, cool. Um, And then the next thing we would do is we would check the Club Hall Porter Association records to see if there's a file on this home. So this launches us into the finding aid, but I'm actually, I would actually like to show you how to get to that. So um, we have a research portal where you can find all of our both digitized content and finding aids and records for books all in one place. And it's called arstudies.com. This was not working yesterday, which is probably why I directly linked to the finding aid. We were having issues with our catalog. Let me see if I can go to it this way. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is the home page. And what I'd recommend doing is if you get to the home page, you just go to whoa, my cat's on the phone. Porter Association. You'll search. And it puts that finding aid right at the top. So you'll know it's a finding aid because it says like the title of the collection and then a description without any photograph or anything like that. If you had popped into a photograph, you would see a photo. You wouldn't see just the logo for, for the Butler Center. Um, like this is a document um, rather than a finding aid. So you just click into that. And then I usually recommend people just click download, download full finding aid. And that just shoots you into just like basically a page listing. And all the finding aid is, is essentially like a table of contents for an archival collection. So we put things in folders, we put those folders in boxes, and then we create like a list of every folder in every box. And this just tells you what those folders are so that you can access them. Um, so there's a couple of different series in this collection. The address research files are the ones that are gonna be most beneficial for you. But I typically just recommend folks just do a keyword search. So we're going to do 1872 cross, and I'm not getting any results. So then I'll try Scipio. Nope, nothing. So um, there wasn't a file created for this house. So there, there isn't research available through the QPA. Um, so we're going to move on to the next thing. Um, I also recommend people check the Chronicle Digital Archive. The Chronicle was the newsletter put out by the Club Porter Association. They still send a digital one, but there was like an actual physical newspaper they put out for a long time. And it just kind of um, documented uh, big historic preservation things going on in town. So if there was like a major change made at Scipio Jones House or a threat of it getting torn down or something like that, that would probably have been documented. Um, so to get to that, you go to this one. Just gonna go through your website and see if maybe it'll get there. Okay. So whenever you're on the QQA website, you just go to what we do, educate, and uh, QQA Chronicle Digital Archive. And it's not gonna work today. Yeah, that's weird. That is weird. Well, we may not be able to search that today, unfortunately. Um. Are you on Cal's Wi-Fi? I am, yeah. Yeah, that's why. It was working at work. I know. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Um, wait, for the Scipio Jones house, there doesn't end up being any results, so it's not particularly helpful to this case study, but um, basically once you get from the Chronicle Digital Archive, you can search by keyword and it will pull up any relevant issues. It's very similar to um, searching newspapers.com, which we're gonna also do, so. Um, I'll show you that and you'll know it's relevant and hopefully getting there gave you the piece you needed. So um, uh, next we're going to look for newspaper articles. So um, just to explain how our newspaper holdings work, prior to 1923, which is the year copyright kicks in, 
Um, we have digital access to the Arkansas Democrat and the Arkansas Gazette, which are kind of the primary papers in the area, um, for the purposes of doing um, research on uh, historically African American properties. Um, the state press is in the process of being digitized by the state archives and will probably within the next year or two be digitally available, which is going to be amazing. Um, okay, I'm going to interrupt for just a sec. Yeah. I pulled it up. I pulled up the blog chronicle on my phone. Oh, you did? Doing digital. Yeah. I mean, I'm on like data. Yeah. yeah. Wi-Fi. And I've been in Scipio, and there are a couple of uh, articles that reference him, but not, the, not necessarily the um, you know, just the elaboration on the property. but.
not about him. This is about a plant. <laughs> so Danielle, if you're interested in something, go to my page. Yeah, so if you're looking for something after 1923, you would just go to the microphone, but I would be looking for something specific. Like, so say you find out, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about how to get to the people in a second, but so say you find out that a property owner of your house, um, you you can see that he died in 1943 and that the house was in somebody else's hands in 1944, you might want to see his obituary. So if you wanted to do that, I would just look around the week that he died. And that's a lot less scrolling than just kind of aimlessly scrolling several years to find something. That's what I was thinking. Interesting. Yeah, and a lot of times obituaries will say something like, uh, services will be in their home at such and such address. And that's kind of a confirmation that they for sure live there. Um, and were living there when he died. Uh, so that that can be really helpful. Obituaries are full of a lot of awesome information. Um, so that, that would be a time I would direct you to the microfilm, but I would look at other resources before you go digging a microfilm just because it can be really time consuming um, if you don't know what you're specifically looking for. Especially for those years that have no indexes at all. Some years are indexed and we have books at the library with those indexes. Um, it stops around uh, 1925 and picks back up probably uh, in the 60s, or yeah, in the 60s, I think it's like 57 isn't even indexed, which is interesting to me because of the central heart crisis. Um, so that's that's something to look at. Um, but yeah, basically, so what it will do is it'll highlight where those individual text search hits are, um, and then you can like clip it, uh, print it, and save it um, there. So if we wanted to. If we wanted to print it, we would just select a portion of the page. So say we just want this article that mentioned him. And whenever it's something long, you want to do it in like pieces. So you would just kind of take a section of it, print it um, like that. And then it will tell you, you know, when you got it and all that sort of thing. Um, I typically recommend people do this even if you don't like paper, just save it as a PDF because it also has the uh, issue and date information and whenever you got it from newspapers. Um, so that's helpful to know for that. Um, so basically, at this point now, what we know is that this house was probably built in 1928, maybe 1930. Um, it is the Scipio Jones house. He was the primary resident. Um, the uh, register nomination also said that he lived there until his death and that he died in 1923. Um, so I just kind of want to walk through uh, looking at the history of the structure and its occupants. I know that we're kind of running low on time. Um, and with the goal of just seeing how the structure may be changed over time and documenting the ownership history. So I just want to show you the two major uh, things for that, uh, the Sanborn Fire Insurance maps and city directories. So for the Sanborn Fire Insurance maps, there is a database available through CALS. Um, that you can access at home. You do not have to be in a library, but you do have to have a library card. Uh, it's very easy to get a cloud library card if you live in Little Rock. Uh, and if you do not live in Little Rock and you'd like to use this database, you're welcome to use it at any library branch. Um, so I'm just going to hop into that and hope my link works. Yay. Okay. So there's a couple of search methods. I usually just tell people to use the interactive map. It looks just like Google Maps if you're familiar with that. Um, so we're just gonna put in the address and you have to kind of do, you know, kind of if you were looking at it uh, for a specific address on your phone. So we're just gonna do 1872 Cross, Little Rock, Arkansas, and click go. And this is great. I just went ahead in 1940 and looked up Jones. So yeah. Have, and it pops, it just pops right here. Yeah, and, yeah. And it also says where his office was, 610 and a half West 9th Street. Perfect. You wanna, Show folks yeah. that are here. Uh, she's pulling out city directories right now. Um, so I'm just going to look at. Uh, so you'll see that there's not every single year. They didn't come and do these surveys every year. They did it in uh, 1886, 1889, 1892, 1897, 1913, 39, 50, and 63. Um, and as soon as you search an address, like all of these show up for you. Okay. 
So you'll have all of them in here. Um, and what this does is it will show you an index map, which will show you what page it's on. This is not taking to the right place. Hold on. There we go. Okay, I was like, that looks, that looks correct. It did not look correct before. Um, so basically, this is an index map that tells you what page of the actual map to look on. So the first thing you're going to do is just know what page you're, so it drops a pin for the address and we're looking for page 72. So we're going to go into that specific link for 1913. I'm doing 1913 because we know that the house was probably constructed in the late 20s. So in 1913, it would be interesting to know if there was a house on that site. Um, so we're going to click that. And it takes you into this list and we're going to navigate to page 72. That's what our index map said. And then you can you can zoom, you know, like pinch zoom or whatever to get to what you're looking for. So here's South Cross and we're looking for 1872. And interestingly, there is no 1872, but there is an 1874. Um, and if you know on a modern map, um, if you looked at a modern map, you would see that uh, 1872 is on the corner now. Um, so it's probable that this was originally 1874 and changed to 1872. Uh, and sometimes they'll have that discrepancy. Yes. I mean, as you progress along, sometimes it'll say like 1874 and now 1872. Yes. Sometimes they can even like. So if you want to know how to um, interpret this what we're looking at, because um, if you aren't familiar with looking at these, these marks probably mean nothing to you. Uh, there is a key you can click. So I click the key and open it, and you can just have it open next to it. And so this tells us that this is a frame dwelling. We know that the Scipio Jones house had a masonry exterior. So this is probably not the same house. Um, we also can compare it to, I printed this just to see, we can compare it to um, our footprint of the home, and it tells us that this back porch is probably too small, um, and and uh, this is a two-story dwelling, which would be the same. So otherwise, it is pretty similar, um, but because we know that the exterior was different, either there was a major modification made to it, and that was not an original house, um, or this is a different house completely. Um, so now that we know that, there's a few things you can do to just kind of get a copy of this if you want. I usually recommend people click the output map and you can zoom the view to whatever you need. So we would need So we would want this little section here. And then you can just print this page. Whenever you print the page, it will give you all the information with it. So you'll have that you know, it, with your records. Um, it tells you it's from 1913, the Sanborn map um, and all that, and what page it was on, um, in case you want to go back and look at it again. So I'm just going to go back to our index map now, and I'm going to pull up 39. So it looks like for 1939, it's on page 49. So I'm going to open this, and I'm going to navigate to page 49. going to zoom again and don't expect it to be in the same place it was on the last map they did these in, in no sort of consistent way right so um if you noticed on the first map we looked at cross was the last street of that map it's not anymore they've moved it over one so and it was on a different page um and now you can tell by 1939 a lot has changed <laughs> this is a much larger home for one look at look at where it is on the plot um it, there's another home on the back of the property. Um, and now you see this red outline. That red outline indicates that this home is brick veneered. And also look at the address. You know, yeah, so it did change from 1874 yeah, to 1872. So a little bit, yeah. Um, so now, now we know that for sure, sometime between 1913 and 1939, a different house was built on this property. Um, and if you knew nothing else at this point, that would help you narrow your window at least a little bit. And it also gives you an idea of, 
you could look at this house and you could look at your modern footprint and you could know has this been significantly changed since this house existed in 1939. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you the later maps, but if you do have a home that uh, you do think has significant changes over time, I would recommend looking at every map um, up until they, they stopped being produced in the 50s. Um, just to give you an idea of if any of those changes happened early enough in the home. Because whenever you're thinking about things like if you get into this research and you decide you want to do rehabilitation for tax credits or anything like that, um, you could argue that those were historically significant changes that happened because they happened so long ago. So that's something um, just to keep in mind as you're documenting things. Uh, but I think we can tell pretty clearly from, you can't see it, but I printed a little map from Air County data. Uh, from that map to this map, there's not a significant change um, in the in the footprint of the home, and we know that it is still brick veneered. Um, so basically, this tells you, and that it's only brick veneered on the first floor because if you looked at the photograph at the beginning, the top of the house is a brick home and the bottom is brick veneered. So that's that's a helpful contextual clue to let you know that this is the same house that was here. Uh, so next. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this part for today because we are running low on time, but I would recommend at this point observing the architectural features of your home now that you know kind of an approximate period it was built. And there's this wonderful style reference guide from the Historic Preservation Program. Um, and once we post this, I meant to say this, once we post this on YouTube, I'll include links. I'll include the link to this with all the active links so that you can get to the stuff without having to remember what URL I said in the middle of the presentation. Um, but the Historic Preservation Program has this great style reference guide that goes through basically all of the major style periods of architecture in Arkansas. And you can look at your home and basically say like, oh, it has this type of table or it has, um, it has this type of siding and that tells me it's probably X style. Um, and that will just, uh, help to, to build kind of your historical argument for your home. Um, and so the next thing we're going to do is, um, I think the most fun part, we're going to look at the people who lived in this home. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, go to the city directory to try to isolate that construction year. Um, for this house, we have the benefit of having that lovely National Register nomination. But for the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to act like we don't know that 1928 date. Um, so that we can figure out how they got there, right? So at this point, I know maybe 1930. That's the date we're going from because that's what that's the approximate date we got from that uh, that data search. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is go to ancestrylibrary.com, and you're going to go to search, and then you're going to go all the way down here to city uh, city and area directories. And this just helps us get a more targeted search because if you just search ancestry for the address or for city of Jones, you're going to get so many results you're going to know two results. So, um, and then I limit to USA. Okay, so it'll take too long to load. And then you can go over here and click Arkansas. Again, I'm just narrowing, trying to get to that. I'm basically just trying to get to the little dot points. Um, and then US city directories. And once we're in here, we can choose. Arkansas, and then we can choose Little Rock. And as we mentioned, not every year had a published city directory. So you'll see in the late 20s, they get spotty because we were starting to be affected by the depression. Paper got very expensive um, and whole probably took a year or two off because they financially couldn't do it. Um, you'll also see in periods of war, there, there are times where things don't get published and that was probably just a conservation effort to make sure that like for the war effort there was enough supplies for the things that really mattered not you know getting killed with that year um so those are things to keep in mind but they start back all the way at 1871 and they go digitally to the late 50s i will note that after 1951 a lot of these issues in ancestry are not complete so you'll get like a hundred pages of it. I'd recommend after 1950 not looking at Ancestry, even though they're technically here, because they're mostly partial editions. You'd be better off looking at a physical book. Um, I also think that if it's within your ability to get to either the Pop-Up Order Association or the Roberts Library during our operating hours, we're open, uh, I just forgot when we're open. <laughs> we're open 10 to 5, Tuesday through Friday, and then Saturday 12 to 4, 
if you're able to uh, get there, looking at the physical books is honestly much, much easier. And we even have some printed microfilm in some of the older ones at the library, just because patrons more or less complain about how annoying the interface is. <laughs> um, but if you've got to do this research, um, you know, it went through your own ancestry subscription, or if you need to be in a branch library that's open later than five, then, you know, this is the way to go. And that's what I'm going to show you today because um, it's the most accessible. So we're going to look around 1930. So we can see that there is a 28, a 29, a 30, and a 31. So I'm going to start with 1930. So once we get into that, we just click the title and it's going to send us into the display. Um, so basically, this is. If you're not familiar with microfilm, it's essentially a photograph taken of the book that was then turned into a stable film that can be run through a machine. And so they just took that film and scanned it and are providing visual access to that. Um, so that's what we're looking at is scans of something that was photographed. So um, it's not always the easiest thing to look at. Um, I just wanted to orient you a little bit with the publication. So. Uh, Basically, you've got your, your standard introductory page, what's what's included in it, an index to uh, to the book, um, an index to advertisers, introduction. Sometimes these are fun because it will tell you a little bit about what's going on in Little Rock that year, um, if you're nerdy and you like to read that sort of stuff. Um, but we're going to skip to trying to find some information about this actual house. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for it in the address first listings initially. As I said, we don't know if that's at the front or back of this book because they were never consistent. So I'm just gonna jump to a random page and see what it looks like. So I'm gonna go to page 100. Don't forget, but also I'm gonna disclaimer out here. Yeah. It gets even more complicated when we add north of the box. Oh so yes. Sometimes you have to make sure you have to read the, the top of the page. Section, yeah. Not the north of the box section because guess what? They're gonna have some of the same name screens we have. Indeed. And you find yourself live clipping on 13th Street from last year and not this year. And it's like, well, Sometimes if there's learning curve, absolutely. So yeah, just, just so I, I zoomed in a little bit and it looks like the name first listings are at the front of this book. And I want to see the address first. So I'm gonna hop back. There's 398. These aren't actual pages though, these are film numbers. That's something to think about too. So there's usually like two pages to a film number, but we want to jump to the back half of the book. So I'm gonna go to page 300. Um and conveniently, it looks like I got to the first page of the address first listing. So it goes in alphabetical order. We're looking for cross street. So it's going to probably be pretty early. We're at 300 now. So I'm going to go to 320. Hello. So we're at the G's now. So I've gone a little too far. So we're at uh, Chester now, we're looking for cross. So I'm just gonna go to 312. Cross, there we go. And we're looking for uh, 1872. So interestingly, whoa, sorry for the people that just got taken on that trip with my Zoom. Um, 1874, Scipio A. Jones. Um, so you saw that the 1874 and the 1872 were both listed on that uh, map. So I guess whenever he first built the home, it was 1874, it later changed to 1872. Um, so that helps us know that we're looking for 1874 whenever it was first built. Um, and we know that Scipio Jones lived there. So now that we know that, we can go back and we can see in the name first listings, I'm just going to go to page 200 and see. Get closer. We're in Jones now. So you'll have just hash marks that indicate that this is all Jones's. Um, 
and then we're looking for Scipio. So there's Scipio. So we can see that his name is Scipio Jones. His wife's name is Lily M. He is a lawyer and he works at 904 Broadway, um, room 225, and he lives at 1874 Cross. So you got all that creepy information just from the city directory. <laughs> Um, and so that's what this is for. So basically on your ownership tracking form, you can now say that in 1930, um, Scipio Jones was living there and he was a lawyer. Um, and you can write down his office address if that's interesting to you too. I went ahead and did that. Um, and so now that I know that he was definitely there in 1930, I'm gonna go back. Um, for the sake of time, um, I am going to skip a few steps because I did the research earlier. <laughs> um, so I'm going to jump back to 1926. Uh, since we know that he was definitely there in 1930, we think it was constructed in 1928. I'm going to jump to 1926 just to see. Um, and basically how I got to 1926 is I just started going backward uh, until I didn't see it there anymore. And that's basically what I encourage people to do is just wait till you don't see it anymore. So for this one, I just go to, since I know Scipio was the resident, I just go to the names first listings. It's a little faster. Um, and I, for the sake of time, I wrote down what page he was on this time. <laughs> so we didn't have to do all that back and forth. Um, well, I say that, I have to paper on that. Linda Johnson. imagine how much faster this is if you're flipping through a book rather than a digital <laughs> publication. Okay, so there's Scipio, his wife's Lily, he's a lawyer. Uh, he's working at 904 Broadway still, but he lives at 1911 Pulaski. He does not live at 1874 Cross. And this is prior to when we think the house was constructed. So that sort of fits the narrative that we know. If we didn't know that though, that would tell us that prior to uh, 1920, the last one before this was 20, sorry, the last one we looked at was 30. So between 26 and 30, some at some point that house was constructed. And that gives us a window to look at. Um, I am going to look up the address in uh, 29, just to give us a little bit more information. Oh, okay. Thank you. I noticed it there as I was looking at Yeah, it. let me glance at that real quick. Yeah. Because I can't, I don't think I, I, I put it up on my phone, but then I was getting a lot of feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there's it's mostly commentary about the city of Jones House from 23, which is like um, so making sure there wasn't any specific questions. Uh, so we're at Cross Street now. We're gonna go to we know the address at this time would have been 1874. And it looks like in 29, Scipio was already there. So that's good news. That tells us that the construction date was prior to 1929. Um, since we are at the last 15 minutes, I did want to, uh, I'm gonna skip over a couple of things. Um, I, so a little more digging, the city director is doing this some more. In 1928, I found out that there was no listing for, 19, or for 1874. Um, it just wasn't in the city directory at all. In the year before that, someone else lived there. And so I wasn't able to find any other concrete evidence um, in the newspaper or otherwise that specifically said that Scipio purchased that land and built that home. Um, I'm sure that the National Register nomination got that from the family members who moved into the home and probably just know that about their family. Um, and that is a way that we find out information. Um, but basically, the, the archival context clues I have are that there was someone living in a house in 1926 at 1874 Cross that was not Sophia Jones. The address ceased to exist in the next city directory 
And by 1929, Scipio was living there. So that leads us to believe that in 1928, the home was constructed. And I believe that's how they got to that construction date. Um, and a lot of times you are kind of just taking the lack of information and building a story from it um, until proven otherwise, because there may be something that comes up at some point that says, no, like we know this other information from this evidence that you didn't have whenever you made your accusation. Um, so it's always good to keep an open mind. Uh, none of this is, I mean, sometimes it's pretty concrete. Sometimes you find like the gold mine of information and it's documented in the newspaper or whatever, but typically you're kind of going off of context and you're building a story. Uh, so that's the story we're building here. Um, I do want to just briefly show you, once you have that information, uh, some other things I'd recommend doing. Hello. Danielle, you do have one question in the chat oh. way back at the beginning and it got kind of buried. Um, are there any ongoing efforts to rebuild these communities? Well, you know, especially in Dunbar, I would say that there's there's effort to both document the historic properties that exist and rehabilitate the significant structures. Um, do you want to speak to any of that? Yeah. Um, Yeah, you might have to speak a little closer. <laughs> I'm going to let Angel answer that question and then I'm going to run through a quick census search. And then yeah, that. just real quick. So, yes, there are efforts to um, uh, renovate, uh, rehabilitate the uh, Scipio Jones's house. There is a foundation, uh, Dunbar, of course, man, um, uh, project development group uh, foundation is working to now to um, obtain grants to help uh, renovate the property. So yes, uh, that is uh, underway as we speak. I think that the house was deeded to the organization in December, 2020. And that question, oh, sorry, Angel, That this is Heather. Um, that question was from Diane Neil Nelson. And she says her aunt and uncle lived there, Thomas and Early Johnson. Yes, they were the prior owners. I think I think Gerald Johnson uh, was the last um, living relative of the Johnson family that actually lived there. But now the home has been deeded by the family, uh, Michael Johnson, that's uh, an attorney out of California to the uh, Dunbar Forest Man. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And, and um, I don't know who asked that question, but if you have like a specific interest in a community and some community ties, I would recommend using those resources that we make available at the Roberts Library, like the Oral History Toolkits and the Memory Lab to act as a citizen archivist and document those communities. That's why we created those tools. We are not in every community. We don't have the connections to to document everything and provide um, access to it all. And so we wanted to empower citizens to kind of do it, do it themselves. So um, that's, that's something I just wanted to add. So, um, you know, let's also throw out there, you know, and just the efforts with the local nonprofit that is promoting preservation of the neighborhood and getting it in large national register status that makes it more economically to work on these houses yeah. because they can get the tax credits as we mentioned earlier. So um, so it's an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing documenting and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, Patricia is saying that these um, uh, National Register designations and things like that uh, afford a lot of opportunity for tax credits and other incentives for grants, and grants for, for, for grants for uh, developing and, and rehabilitating uh, these structures associated with these communities. Um, I, I don't know if I have a ton of time to dump into census stuff because we are running out of time, um, but I, I think that, um, I just want to show you Ancestry real quick if you're not familiar with it. Um, you can look at birth, marriage, death, census records, and other uh, local history resources. Um, you can search these owners of the houses as you're finding them in the city directory in the census records. Uh, that will tell you more about their family makeup. Did they have kids? Um, what was their education level? Where were they from originally? How did they even get to Little Rock? Um, to just try to form kind of
kind of a, a fuller picture um, of, of the, the story of your house in the context of the community. Um, and we have a monthly session called Finding Family Facts that digs into more of the genealogy resources and how to use them. And since I basically ran out of time before I could even uh, do a census search, um, and I want to leave time for any additional questions, um, I recommend attending that. It's great, it's on Zoom. Um, and uh, Rhonda Stewart is like a wealth of knowledge and would be way better at showing you how to use any of these resources than I would anyway. So um, I use them in the context of like work like this and uh, helping patrons, um, but but she's the genealogy expert. So I definitely recommend attending Finding Family Facts and you can find out when it's hosted. It's it's on one of the Mondays. I just always forget which one. Heather, which Monday is it? Sorry, I was typing. Um, <laughs> um, it is the second Monday of the month from 3.30 until 5. And so in September, no, that's that's Monday. That's the 8th. So okay. August, so is this coming Monday? So it's this coming Monday, yes. Okay. It's this coming Monday, 3.30 to 5. And we do it over Zoom. So, um, you know, even if it's something while you're at your desk at work and you can listen in the background, um, she'll introduce you to all these resources uh, since I didn't get a chance to. And that will just help you kind of fill out uh, the, the history of the property um, and, uh, and and then kind of contextualizing it now you know the dates and everything how does that fit into the development of the community and there's a lot of resources um, I'd look at the National Register nominations for those communities I'd look at the Encyclopedia of Arkansas uh, to learn more about the context of the community and where where your property kind of fits into its development and that just kind of helps you build a richer narrative um, and, and a more powerful story. Uh, so that's kind of everything I had about doing doing the research, um, and now I am here to uh, answer questions for the next six minutes. Real quick, that find your family is up in Dallas. Yes, yeah, it's through the Roberts Library. Our local history genealogy specialist, Dr. Stewart, and she lives in the number. This is Williams. Yeah, so basically, uh, so the historic footprint of the home would be whenever you're looking at the sandbar maps and that sort of thing, like the literal footprint of the home on the plot of land. And the modern footprint would be like what you're looking at um, through AR County data, which is the kind of outline of the home in modern times. So, like, what 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 does the footprint of your home look like now? Okay. The boundaries. Uh, that, 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 that doesn't necessarily change. That's what you're no, no, it doesn't necessarily okay. change. Yeah, so I just I just recommend comparing that historic sandbar map to your modern footprint. See if there were any changes, especially um, uh, we like a lot more room now, so it's possible that conditions were added. Um, I live in a quote unquote historic home in Canada Village um, that was built in '49, and it's had two additions uh, over its over its uh, 70 years. So um, you know, I I have the, the benefit of meeting the owner who added most of it, so that was helpful. But uh, you can kind of track some of that through the sandboard map. So I was able to see the first edition on the sandboard maps and then the other one through uh, getting in contact with better owners. I was able to figure out what was done. Because um, we had three call spaces. And I was like, why? That doesn't make sense. Something mm -hmm. happened here. Um, that does make sense, right? Yeah. And you know your home, right? So, like, if you know you have three call spaces, you know something happened. And, and so you can kind of use those context clues to try to dig into what changes were made. Um, and I, and I did also mention, you can make the argument that those additions are still historically important, right? Because like, if the house was built in 1910, it had an addition in 1930, that's almost 100 years old at this point. That house is still existing, even though it's not, you know, it's you deciding what the period of significance of your house is. So. Are there, uh, let me just, Heather, is there anything else in the chat? So we had a question online about getting links to Ancestry, and Ancestry is accessible only inside a CALS building. You can be either at one of our computers at one of our branches or on our Wi-Fi, I guess yes. technically in our parking lots. Um, but you do, you do have to be, so I can't actually give you a link necessarily. Yeah. Um, you do have to be on our Wi-Fi in order to use it. That's that's the rules they gave us. Yeah, if you are on your own device um, in a library branch, the URL is ancestrylibrary.com rather than ancestry.com. 
um, to get to the library uh, subscription if you are on your own device, which sometimes it's nice to be because then you can like download the stuff to your own computer and that sort of thing. Um, I kind of prefer to just use my own laptop on the Wi-Fi. So um, yeah, I've also put my contact information up there. Um, I'm regularly on the research desk. I'm happy to make an appointment and come out with you and hang out with you and help you. Um, I, I'm a public library employee. That's my job. So um, if all of this was a lot of information, that's because it is. Um, and I'm happy to help it when I can and, and when, when my schedule allows. So yeah, awesome. Is there anything else? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Let me go. Oh yeah, the the uh, the Thursday is the preservation conversation, right? Yes. So okay. this Thursday, um, we're having our preservation conversation about Sidney Jones and um, the portrait that Wade Hampton did. We're partnering with Cal's. We're partnering with the Artists from Neighborhood Association, and it wasn't until. Angel said it a minute ago. The reason we chose August is because it's his birthday month. I mean, that was that was a uh, method to our madness. But um, but it, uh, if you're interested, just uh, send us an email to qqa at and uh, we have uh, actually more space than usual because we're having it in the Nugent Center over at Flanders Smith. So quite a bit of space. We're going to have a little reception at five thirty, and then the program starts at six, and we usually wrap up about seven o'clock. And then the other thing I mentioned was the city garden. Um, here at Ice Cream Social. Um, we have a long history of German uh, residents of Little Rock and with their heritage, they brought beer gardens. And um, uh, one of my board members is a uh, owner of Stone's Throw uh, founder, and he is providing what they're calling George Brothers Ale, which was one of the earliest beer gardens. I think the first documented beer garden in Little Rock, and that's August 28th, and that's a fundraiser. So you buy a ticket, you get a couple of food drinks, a couple of scoops of ice cream, Bob Wally, and if you're hungry, Thank you. I think our announcement again for September the 24th, the Dunbar Historic Neighborhood, our eighth annual um, community festival right here in the community, right here on the grounds where we are now. And then um, also you can go to our, our website, uh, Dunbar, uh, dhna.com, and we're on Facebook, um, Dunbar, DH, or Dunbar Historic Neighborhood Association to, to keep up with the things that we're doing. Uh, uh, we would love to uh, have you as members as well. Any questions? I gave my card out to everybody, and then you can also reach out to us, to us on social media. But make sure you mark your calendars for September 24th for the Dunbar Community Festival. Thank you. All right. I think we're going to wrap up right at 12. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. And again, if you have any questions, um, I think Heather dropped my contact information in the chat. Um, it's also on our website at robertslibrary.org if you just go to the contact list down on there also. So thanks. All right, that's wrap. Awesome. Okay, so if anybody wants to take a poster, please do. And